Now, here is our former colleague Adam Leventhal, who is with us because he's produced a documentary and a series of articles for The Athletic on the devastation caused by the earthquakes in Turkey in February. Former Premier League footballer Christian Atsu was killed in the disaster, which took the lives of more than 50,000 people. I'm going to speak to Adam in just a second, but first, here is a clip from the documentary. This is the Hatay Spore home dressing room. It really is a, a remarkable but also poignant scene because it's very much been suspended in time. After the, the victory um, that evening, which Christian Atsu obviously scored uh, the winning goal, that's where he would have been sat and got changed and, and then gone home. But all around as well there is remnants of just a usual post-match. Adam, how did this come about? Well, obviously there's been so much attention on, on Istanbul for the, the Champions League final and we wanted to tell the story on The Athletic of the football clubs that were impacted by the earthquake in February, as you mentioned, on February the 6th, twin earthquakes, two of the most powerful earthquakes that the country has seen for almost a century, 7.8 and 7.7 .7 on the Richter scale, one at four o'clock in the morning, one at one o'clock in the afternoon following up. Um, and we wanted to go and almost tell the story through the eyes of, of the football clubs, many of which stopped playing. Um, and, you know, there is so much attention on Istanbul, the glitz and the glamour and the places that I went to were anything but. I mean, we can, I think, have a look at the, the map of, of Turkey just to sort of show the, the geography of it. Um, obviously, Istanbul up there in the, in the top left-hand corner. The area impacted was down in the southeast of the country, also in, in northern Syria, which obviously has its own issues. Um, Hatay was where the epicentre was, and that was the football club that we just saw there, Hatay Spor, um, who were immersed in the devastation, not only for the, the community, but in particular for the, for the football club and, and the loss of, of Christian Atsu. And that was the, the dressing room um, at the stadium, which was a, a very poignant sight to see. It must have felt, I don't know, what were, what were your emotions as you, as you were in, walking around the stadium? It was, it, was, it was very emotional, actually. I think, you know, football fans watching this, you know, stadiums, are emotional places, they're eerie places when they're not empty, but when you know what happened there, um, in the last minute of the game against Kesim Passa, Christian Atsu had, had scored the goal and he'd not been in the team for a couple of months, he'd had an injury, and this was the, the scene post-match, suspended in time and almost like a time capsule. Everyone would have then gone home that evening and that's when a few hours later the earthquake struck. So that the contrast between seeing that stadium and thinking of the, the joy that he had, having knocked on the door of his manager, Volkan Demirel, some people will be familiar with, with him, former Fenerbahce goalkeeper, Turkey international, um, said, look, I want a chance. The manager then threw him on and, and he said, it was great. I was so happy the last time I saw him and then he was gone. So. Yeah, the contrast was it was very it was a very emotional trip as a whole to be honest what did you see outside the stadium well in the immediate um outskirts of the of the stadium at hatai which did ha suffer some some damage as you can see there there is i mean there's, there's a crack there on the on the ground but also those tents that you can see many of the stadiums became homes for the displaced ultimately afad is the the disaster um, emergency response unit from the Turkish government and they put up tents yes here in in the stadium car park but also everywhere you go around the affected area in Hatay along the fault line through cities like Karaman Marash, Gaziantep, Malatya, Adiaman you will see huge swathes of cities which are now rubble completely leveled and what has sprung up afterwards is tents because that's where the displaced are living. A lot of people have left those communities and, and gone to safer places like Istanbul, for example, and other cities around. But many that are remaining, many Syrian refugees who've moved over the border from the northeast of Syria as well, living in places like, like Hatay, that's where they're living in tents. And when the earthquake struck, it was in the middle of winter. It was minus sub-zero temperatures. Now it's unbearably hot and Yes, people have a roof over their head, but it's so hot in those tents and, you know, they're trying to transition them into container cities and things like that. But it's, 
it's not adequate for anyone. But when were those shots filmed? The, the, the that tent? was, what, 10, 10 days ago? Right, so, so, so four months on mm. um, from, the, from the earthquake yeah. uh, and people are still living in that situation. Yeah. How are they dealing with it? I think it's very difficult for everyone. Um, I think that the promise has been made by the, the president, newly, newly elected president, um, Erdogan, um, to rehouse everyone within a year. Um, but yeah, four months on, people are still living in tents. There are other scenes around the country, um, in, in Antakya, for example, where there are huge areas of the city which are still in rubble, still buildings that are in the state of collapse, still huge areas. I mean, this is, this is, um, this is one of the scenes, and this is repeated all over the place. Um, there are just areas like this, which are where buildings once stood, and many areas have been cleared. I mean, this is a, this is a street in a place called Iskenderun. I'll tell you the story of them in a moment's time, but um, there is so much clear up to, to still be done, so much healing to still be done for the, for the people that have been affected. It's very difficult to, to even get your head around it. I mean, you mentioned the, the headline figure there of 60,000 deaths, another 100,000 people injured, and those are only conservative estimates of, of, the, of the damage that has been, that has been done. Christian Yatsu died in the earthquake. What did you hear about him when you were out there? A lot of warmth. Um, you know, aside from the story I was saying about him um, getting his opportunity, just a very humble individual, very generous individual, um, someone that was very, although he wasn't playing, was was a part of the of the fabric of the of the club, and they suffered his loss. But also, and this is, you know, it expands beyond just, just the football teams. Within their football team, there were six other people that, that died. A couple of academy players, someone who worked in the kitchen, their sporting director, goalkeeping coach as well. So as a family, as a football club, they have suffered huge losses. The worst um, amount of losses of any of the football clubs in, in Turkey. But then, for example, the, the media officer at Hatay Sport, we were speaking to him. We were stood on the pitch where uh, Atsu scored his goal. And he was saying, well, yeah, I, I, we're suffering losses as a club, but I lost my, my aunt, I lost five cousins. And these are stories, every, everyone that you speak to, for example, my guide who was there, he lost someone um, who was uh, in the same building that Christian Atsu was in, and they were unable to ever recover uh, his friend's body. Um, everyone in that region has been affected one way or another. This is the the scene of, of the Renaissance Residence Hotel where, where Christian Atsu sadly died, along with Tano Suvut, who was the sporting director of um, Hatay Sport. I mean, it just shows you the scale of the mm. building that collapsed. Um, and there are, and it's worth mentioning, there are investigations ongoing. That's the, the swimming pool, which would have you know, been on the, on the ground floor of the hotel. There are investigations going on across the affected area into why so many buildings did collapse. There's you know, investigations into building practices and things like that, which, are, which will continue for quite some time. Um, but yeah, Christian Atsu, and he was the, the most high profile name in terms of a footballing audience. And that's why so much attention was on it then. But we wanted to go back and see what has happened since. And as you can see from those pictures, there is still so much, so much to be done. It feels a bit banal to us, but are they still playing football in those areas? Some of the some of the clubs are um, nine clubs stopped playing, and some clubs actually relocated out of the area to, to continue. There was an option given to all of the the clubs in that area to to stop playing by the Turkish Football Federation. Some took that opportunity because it meant that they were not going to be relegated from their league. For example, Gaziantep, they didn't suffer any losses within the football club, but they thought well, we're gonna, we can loan our players out and we will stay in the league. But there are other stories of, of teams that were in the affected area. We saw the shot earlier on of, of Iskenderun near to Hatay, third division side. That's their training ground there. On the night of the earthquake, the team were in that hotel. Their coaches were in the building that was there. And they ran across the road to try and save their coach, um, it was a goalkeeper coach, also a strength and conditioning coach. They managed to save the, the strength and conditioning coach, pull him out of the rubble, but he later died. The goalkeeper coach also died. An academy player also died in, in the earthquake. But they 
resolved to carry on, to play on, to almost act as inspiration to Iskenderun. And within that, there are so many twists in terms of timing and logistics, the difference between life and death, that they recruited a new coach in Istanbul where they relocated, Levent Shaheen, who used to be the assistant coach um, for Turkey. And unbeknownst to him when he took over, his cousins were staying in that same building and they had actually been saved by the players that he was now coaching. So the link between Levent Shahin and the Iskenderun players is immense. And they're sort of playing on with that, that feeling of trying to heal themselves with, with football. And they're still playing in the playoffs. They went on a great run in adversity, 11 wins out of 15. Um, and yeah, they made the, they've made the playoffs. They lost the first leg of their semi-final a couple of days ago. They play again and I've sort of, absorbed that story and I'm, I'm, although they play in orange and, and blue, which is the, uh, the team colours of my rivals Luton Town <laughs> uh, as a Watford fan, I've, I've, I've adopted them and I really want them to succeed because they are an inspirational story that's come out of this, this utter devastation. You showed us on that map uh, how far away it is geographically from Istanbul and the Champions League final, but it also <clears throat> just feels a world away. Yeah, absolutely. It's... It, it, it is, it, it's only, but it's only an hour's flight away. It's so close. And I spent some time in Istanbul. I spoke to some people that had, had moved to there. And life goes on. It's, it's a wonderful city. The, the fans that go there, I'm sure there's many Manchester City fans that are you know, leaving now if they haven't already left. And they're going to have a great time in Istanbul. But it's, it's really worth remembering that not that far away. What, 300 miles, you know, if you were, if you were traveling, 12 hours by plane maybe, or by coach, you know, to, to travel there. It's the same country. This is also Turkey, and there is still so much work to be done. And, and one final thing I, I should say, actually, Hatay Spor's president, Lutfu Savas, you know, he's, a, he's a, an upstanding member of the community. He's a, he's a mayor of, the, of Hatay, and he was also saying, and he was quite open in being quite pleading about it, we would love to play a team like Manchester City, like Liverpool, like Manchester United, to have some sort of fundraiser to earn some money for Hatay Sport because we need the money. This region needs the money. So, you know, they are, they're big clubs. They're big established clubs like Hatay Sport, but they are, they're in desperate need of help. And, and that, that applies to the whole of that affected, that affected region, which stretches 140,000 square miles. So it's a hell of a, hell of a big region. So where can we see your documentary? Well, there's a series of articles on, on The Athletic. There's a three-part series. Um, there's also a two-part documentary, which is, which is now out wherever you get your, your podcasts, and there'll be, there'll be further video on social media and, and beyond as well. So, yeah. Good luck with it. Thanks Thank for coming you, in. Cheers.